just go ahead and introduce our speaker today. He'll be speaking today about um, the supply and demand of refined oil products in North Korea. David von Hippel is an independent consultant and a senior associate at the Nautilus Institute and a longtime expert on North Korea's um, economic policy and its energy uh, situation. And um, he, he will speak today for about 20 minutes or so. Um, and then um, Dan Wirtz will comment on his presentation. And then we will open it up to about half an hour of Q&A um, for all of you who are joining us um, virtually. Let me just draw your attention to the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Please submit your questions in that Q&A uh, forum, I guess, and I will be moderating those in the Q&A session um, after we hear from our speakers today. All right, so without further ado, let me turn it over to you, David, and um, thank you again for joining us for this special public seminar today. Uh, thank you, Celeste, and it's, it's good to be here. Uh, let me see if I can get my screen started. So uh, what I'd like to talk about today is the supply and demand for refined oil products in the DPRK or North Korea. I'll start with an introduction and then an overview of the DPRK energy sector, uh, including our estimates of the impact of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic on um, energy use in the DPRK, particularly in this year, 2020. I'll talk about uh, our estimates of DPRK oil supply and demand, provide you with an uh, introduction to demand and supply balances. Uh, talk about oil storage and oil resources in the DPRK, the DPRK refining industry, and oil product imports from various sources. And then a couple uh, pages of conclusions. So one th really central um, element here is that the DPRK's energy insecurity, that is the lack of access to affordable and, uh, su and fuels of su sufficient supply is a key driver of its choices to pursue nuclear weapons and delivery systems. Basically, it's uh, the, the use of, of the nuclear weapons and delivery systems to get the attention of the international community. Um, and in order to try and build its economy, it really needs that, that uh, access to, to secure energy supplies. The energy sanctions from the UN Security Council that have been passed to date are unlikely, we believe, to have the desired effects on the DPRK um, in terms of bringing them to the table with, with a, 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 um, a, a, a uh, the ability to to make the the types of decisions to reduce their nuclear arsenal that um, are are desired. Energy supply and demand, particularly for oil and oil products and for electricity, have played a key role in previous negotiated settlements between the DPRK and um, the international communities. For example, the agreed framework in 1994, the six party talks in the early 2000s. Um, there's always been an element of the DPRK receiving energy aid of some kind or other or negotiating to receive that in exchange for concessions on the nuclear weapons side. So when and if the parties return to the table, North Korean energy insecurity considerations and security considerations will again be crucial to reaching and implementing agreements uh, on addressing DPRK threats, again, nuclear weapons and, and uh, missile systems, for example. So an overview of the DPRK energy sector. As of 1990, per capita energy use in, in the DPRK was three times what China's was at that time, and about 50% of Japan's, even though Japan had much, much larger economy. Um, since the fall of the Soviet Union, there's been a uh, there was a rapid decline in the early 1990s in the supply of improved, imported crude oil. First, uh, the Russian uh, supplies were, were not cut off, but they were much reduced because the DPRK was uh, obliged to, to pay full price, full international price for them, as opposed to getting them on a concessional basis. Um, there were some imports of, of crude oil from the Middle East, perhaps in, in, uh, in exchange for uh, weapons. 
in the early 1990s. Oil imports have been pretty much stable since 2000, however, they've been coming from China via a pipeline across the border. And I'll talk more about that later. Relatedly, there's been a continuing degradation of electricity generation and the transmission dis and distribution infrastructure. Some of it uh, was built quite early on, in, in, in fact, in the Japan, Japanese colonial times, and some of it was built uh, with help by, from the Soviet Union. And as a result of, of, the, of the breakup of the Soviet Union, there have been um, lack of spare parts uh, for, the, for the transmission distribution system for generators. Uh, since so so since about 1990, there there have been a, a pattern of unreliable and spotty supplies of electricity. Pyongyang may have fairly good power much of the time, although some uh, folks, some some expats who live there have have noted periods when there hasn't been much power, in, even in Pyongyang. But some areas uh, of the country have have received very little electricity, just maybe a a few days a year at harvest time, for example. There have also been some additions of hydroelectric plants. Um, and, and some of those, have, those, but those have not been very large. And in some cases, they, they've had some problems. So as a result, consumers are generating some of their own power. There have been a lot of, uh, of investment in, in small solar photovoltaic panels, mostly imported from China or made from parts imported from China, and of diesel and, and gasoline engine generators. There's been continuing degradation of industrial facilities as the, as the markets for industrial products from the DPRK were at one point tied to those in the Soviet Union, but there's been some addition, light industry additions, especially for export, especially in, in, in textiles for, for export to China. Um, Net result is there's been about a 60% reduction in energy use per capita since um, since about 1990 in, in the DPRK by our estimates, uh, with a severe restriction in the energy services available, the lighting, heating, um, and and the passenger transport, and in industrial products manufactured. Uh, at the same time, there's been a replacement. People have needed needed fuel, been unable to pay for it or unable to get it, and have, have gone to the forest to um, chop wood or, or to use uh, uh, biomass residues from, from agriculture. And that, that energy has replaced electricity and oil and coal, but at a fairly low efficiency and with resulting deforestation and soil degradation. So coal remains the dominant form of energy use the DPRK has billions of tons of reserves of, of coal uh, in the, of the anthracite and lignite types, but coal is often used uh, rather inefficiently. Um, many of the designs of, of power plants and, um, and, and industrial facilities that use coal go back probably to the 50s or, or beyond in terms of uh, com comparison with, with uh, those in the West. Uh, so the impact of COVID on the energy sector, we don't have any direct data. Uh, there's hardly any direct data on energy use in the DPRK in, in general. Um, but COVID-19 has undoubtedly affected DPRK oil product supply and demand, just as it has affected oil product supply and demand throughout the world. Uh, determining the net impact is a matter for analysis and estimation. Our estimate is that the lockdown has and will continue to restrict fuel demand, uh, fuel products demand in many sectors through 2020, um, and that restrictions on fuel imports, both on and off books, meaning those fuel imports that are reporting custom statistics and those that are not, uh, by limiting and slowing cross-border cross commercial traffic by land and sea, particularly from China and, and from other trading partners, will um, has has and will continue to restrict fuel imports. Although apparently those have been coming back a little bit uh, according to other reports. Now, now I just wanna show you how we organize our analysis of the DPRK energy sector. It's organized as, as an energy balance. And the energy balance is a table with energy supply, energy transformation that is changing one fuel into another or moving a fuel from place to place. 
and energy demand uh, all uh, in, in the rows and then in the columns you have the different types of fuels. And this is a way to make sure that your assumptions about um, energy supply and energy demand are, are internally consistent. And we know that there must be some difference between what we're estimating and, and what the real situation is, although in the DPRK in terms of energy supply and demand, although I don't think anybody even perhaps inside the DPRK has the full um, story and full statistics on, on um, how, how this is done. So we're just trying to put a, an estimate out there and, and hope that it's helpful. Um, this is, a, this is a, a graph of energy demand uh, over time by sector. And you can see that the, the one bar here, the one element of the bars that, that has not changed very much is the residential sector. But that masks a, a couple of changes. Um, the residential use hasn't changed much, but there's been a shift from coal use and electricity use to, to biomass use, and the biomass use is inefficient. So the actual energy services that residents get from their energy use has, has declined. Um, there has been some growth in the transport and commercial sectors between 2010 and about 20. 16, 17 when the, when the sanctions cut in. And since then, uh, by our estimate, it hasn't changed very much, although it has gone down in 2020 as a result of, of COVID. This is just some images of DPRIK energy demand. DPRK uh, have, have been pretty good about uh, using what they have to the fullest extent. So you find trucks in some places, especially in rural areas that are fueled with uh, coal or with biomass. Uh, if you go into the subways, they're quite opulent, but, uh, but, but they're quite dark. So there's quite a lot of conservation of, of electricity by simply curtailing use. And then you find, uh, for example, transport, where, where in, in one military vehicle, you can find goods and soldiers and civilians all being moved from place to place. And, and that's, that's quite common you see on the roads in the DPRK. Here's energy demand by fuel, and, and here's what I was telling you before. There's, there's a reduction due to supply and income restrictions uh, after about 2016 due, due to um, UN Security Council um, sanctions, and then a, a decline in 2020, and then and, and there's still a significant amount of wood and biomass use over time. So shifting to uh, North Korean oil supply and demand, we have to say that there's very little solid information about energy demand in the DPRK, but our estimates are consistent with available information and anecdotes from visitors. But we recognize that true figures may be different and, and we welcome the opportunity to up update our uh, materials if, if people have better, better information. For the years 2014 to 2020, we've assumed that additional oil products have been imported off books, that is smuggling or, or some other kind of, of, uh, of transfer, because A, uh, some of the off books imports, even, even those that have been reported by other analysts have probably gone undetected. And B, it seems improbable that oil demand could decrease enough to account for the decrease in total fuels imports that would be consistent with fully, fully operating and, and fully effective sanctions. Um, it's possible that these off books imports were either greater than estimated, meaning higher oil products use, particularly pre-COVID, uh, or that some demand was served by drawing down stocks of oil products. And, and I'll talk about oil storage in the DPRK in a second. There's uh, the United Nations Panel of Experts reports, which, which are uh, based on reports from mostly, I think, United States agencies, suggested that North Korean oil products imports via ship-to-ship -ship transfers in 2018 and 2019 may have been as much as half a million tons of diesel and mostly diesel and some gasoline if those ships were full. We've sort of assumed that those ships were probably partially full, and and that's uh, and that would be consistent with our our assumptions. So here are some of the uh, some of the figures that uh, that are generated by our analysis. You can see gasoline use in the DPRK 
actually increasing in the early years of the 2000s and, and sort of leveling off and then decreasing in 2020 as most people are indoors. Um, although much of the gasoline use is, is, is probably in official vehicles and, and taxis. Um, and then diesel fuel use, similar, similar uh, scene. You have diesel fuel use increasing quite a lot in the, in the early 20, uh, 2010s and then uh, going down in part as a result of sanctions. But one of these, one of the bars in both cases, the, the red bar on the gasoline side and the blue bar on the, on the diesel side, this represents uh, people generating their own power using gasoline and diesel fired generators. So uh, we've been able to estimate the, the capacity of these generators from Chinese import statistics. And it, it's quite interesting. It's, it's, it's quite a lot actually relative to the entire generation capacity of the country. Um, heavy fuel oil is a different story. Heavy fuel oil is not used much in the DPRK economy. And there's a, there's a, there's a, uh, there's a decline in, in heavy oil in, in the last few years, and I'll tell you why in just a second. Um, the oil supply and demand balance, this is, this is like the demand balance I showed you before, except in this case, this is a more detailed balance. And, and you can see it's focused, uh, it, maybe you can see if you, if, if, if you have good eyes, you can see that it's focused on the different uh, types of, of, of oil products uh, along the top of the, in the columns. DPRK oil storage. We we recently published a report on um, the uh, estimating the the total oil storage in the DPRK based on uh, on an older 1980s uh, CIA study, and uh, we found that there's a lot of oil storage around the country, or what looks like oil storage. Uh, it's probably about a, a, a million and a half cubic meters, which translates into a little less than that in terms of um, tons of oil products or oil or, or crude oil. And this is just one example. So this is uh, the, this is at, at uh, in Nampo, uh, which is the port, the main port to the, um, in the city of, of Pyongyang. Uh, you, you can see a number of new oil tanks have appeared in satellite images at, uh, to, to supplement some of the old ones. And there's a, there are footings for, for a, a number of new tanks that have been poured and, and, ha, and are, are slowly being, being built. So DPRK has oil storage. The oil is coming from somewhere. Um, and some, and uh, so it's possible that some of, the, some of the demand is being met through oil storage. Uh, here is a, a, an image of domestic oil resources. DPRK has some domestic oil resources, apparently offshore mostly, and some onshore. But uh, there's been there's been very little, perhaps uh, hardly any, uh, actually domestic actual domestic production. There have been several times over the years when when there have been joint ventures, partnerships with with uh, other. Um, with firms in China and firms even in in in, uh, in the UK, but they have largely been unsuccessful for various reasons. Uh, not not uh, also uh, the reasons certainly including the the political situation in the Koreas. Um, DPRK oil imports from China. Uh, so as I said earlier, there uh, from about 2000 on imports from China ha were pretty consistent at about 500 million tons per year. These were reported imports, imports reported in custom statistics. And uh, the, the blue line here is, is, is oil products from China. But something happened in 2015, which is that China stopped reporting crude oil exports to the DPRK, although they almost certainly have continued. Our estimate is that uh, those 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 uh, ex exports do continue. They're coming from uh, via a pipeline going across the Yalu River in the area of the of Sinuju and 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 Dandong, um, but uh, and perhaps have even risen over time because that pipeline has to be used in order to keep functioning 
because the crude that's going through it will actually solidify, if, especially in cooler weather, and 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 block the pipeline if it if it doesn't keep doesn't keep flowing. So the result is we do the, the only the only window that we have on crude oil supplies from China are reports by China to the United Nations Security Council, at which they they are every year reporting the maximum exports that are allowed by the UN Security Council, but I, I think that they're probably exporting a little more. There are two major refineries in the DPRK. There's one in the Northwest, the Ponghua oil refinery, which uh, as I note, uh, noted, receives crude oil from China. And here's a, an interesting point is in 2016, that refinery was upgraded to add what's called a catalytic cracking unit. And that is, allows it to take some of that heavy fuel oil that it couldn't, that the DPRK didn't have that much use for, and turning it into lighter products, especially gasoline. So, so that's that's provided that's provided sort of a, a jump in gasoline supplies in the DPRK. There's a refinery in the northeast at Songbong that's a little bigger, still small by by uh, international standards that was fed with crude oil from uh, the Soviet Union and hasn't been operating very much in recent years at all. There have been various uh, opportunities and, and various interest in, in investing in it and, and re rehabilitating it, but uh, hasn't happened as far as we know. And then there might be a third simple refinery near Nampo. This is a, an image of the Sungri chemical plant at Songbong. And uh, is currently, as 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 we understand it, inactive. So uh, this is a, a pie chart of DPRK refinery output in 2019, and and this is going to be a, it shows a significant difference from 2016 because this gasoline wedge has expanded, and this HO, HFO heavy fuel oil wedge has contracted. Um, so that that's been a significant difference over the last five years. Oil product imports are estimated to have increased sharply between 2010 and 2016, which have provided fuel for the econo economic growth that was noted by a number of analysts during that period. Those imports have declined probably in, in 2017 through 2019 and 2020 uh, is due to enforcement of, of the sanctions, the um, Security Council sanctions by the international community. But we we, rec we believe that a significant volume of refined products must still have reached the DPRK through off books channels, and there have been a number of, of uh, reports of that, uh, including through the um, panel of experts to the Security Council sanctions. This is our image of petroleum product supplies in general through time, uh, and our estimates. Um, both from domestic sources and from imports. And, and you can see that the imports, the, the, the gasoline refined domestically uh, increased a little bit, for example, uh, actually fairly significantly between 2016 and 2017. Um, and, uh, but overall, overall supplies probably fell fairly significantly between 2016 and 2017. And much of that fall was probably absorbed by people using their diesel and gasoline generators less. So in conclusion, uh, sanctions have made off books oil product imports much more important to the DPRK in recent years. Uh, and oil supply related sanctions may make life more difficult for ordinary North Koreans by leaving more energy services unmet, but I don't think they've had a whole lot of impact on the weapons programs. And DPRK organizations and citizens are constantly getting better at, at workarounds to, to um, finding ways to, to essentially live their lives, let make their economy go in the absence of, of, uh, of, of the official oil imports or of the official coal exports that, that generate a lot of uh, of economic activity. Um, sustainable solutions to the DPRK's long-term energy problems are a necessary but not sufficient condition for enduring success in weapons of mass destruction negotiations. 
So if we fail to address the underlying needs for energy services, uh, we're not gonna be able to solve the, the nuclear weapons issue. It's, it's the, any, and any solution is going to be unachievable or unsustainable. So solving the linked North Korean weapons and energy insecurity issues is gonna require a phased and coordinated and stepwise and multifaceted approach on the local, national, and regional levels. And that's it, thank you. Thank you very much, David. Before I turn it over to Dan um, for some comments about your presentation, I just wanted to invite uh, the participants to feel free to submit questions to the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Um, but I think, uh, David, you give us a lot of food for thought, uh, everything from the history of the energy sector to its current, one of the last two decades long challenges and also prospects for um, how to resolve not just energy insecurity in North Korea, but the broader um, concerns about North Korea's nuclear weapons program and its relationship to the sanctions regime. So I think Dan, you're going to offer us some comments now and then we'll, I'll um, field the questions after Dan's discussion. And yeah, let me add my thanks, David, for a great, uh, really thoughtful and comprehensive presentation. Uh, I think that the topic of North Korean energy security is really important for a number of reasons, trying to understand the country. Uh, everything from the question of, you know, are sanctions effective or aren't they, to trying to understand the North Korean economy, uh, to thinking perhaps creatively about incentives at the negotiating table with North Korea to, of course, um, the ways that energy availability or lack of availability affects the everyday lives of North Koreans. Uh, so I'm just going to get started here with a couple of uh, quick slides sharing my screen. If you'll hold on. So two key images here. I think um, right here I've got the image of the Korean Peninsula uh, at night uh, shot by a NASA uh, observation satellite. You can see China very clearly. Uh, you can see South Korea, um, this big, big uh, speck of light where Seoul is. And North Korea is most conspicuous by its absence here, by the lack of energy. You can see a speck in Pyongyang, a few little dots throughout the country. But for the most part, there's this whole picture of uh, modernity, industrialization, you know, energy access throughout Northeast Asia and North Korea is left out of that image. And you can contrast that with um, North Korea's coat of arms or its national emblem, uh, which is an image uh, putting electricity front and center. It features the Supong Dam, a hydroelectric dam on the China-North Korea border, uh, one actually uh, built during the Japanese colonial period, bringing in uh, the issue that David brought up of uh, aging infrastructure. Uh, but it shows energy use is, is really key to North Korea's self-presentation. And of course, in the, the background of that image as well is uh, Mount Baekdu, which is the uh, mythological birthplace of the Korean nation, as well as the mythological birthplace of Kim Jong-il. So there's a real contrast uh, in those two images between North Korea's self-presentation and, and the reality uh, on the ground, at least as it comes uh, to energy. I think it's, um, it's important not to think of North Korea as you know, being too out of touch, too backwards, uh, certainly in the sectors where North Korea has put in a lot of investments. Uh, they are quite advanced in terms of science and technology, uh, particularly nuclear arms, ballistic missiles, uh, cyber uh, capabilities have risen dramatically in recent years as well. Uh, but of course, North Korea's energy infrastructure uh, has not uh, improved significantly uh, in past decades. It's still, as uh, David's presentation pointed out, uh, aging uh, badly in need of upgrades. So there was a a lot of subsidized energy going to North Korea during the Soviet period. North Korea's industry was very, very energy inefficient, which is part of uh, the fact of being a planned economy. A steel mill, for example, if it has essentially free electricity uh, from the plan, 
isn't going to use it effectively. And then once those subsidies ran out, uh, the North Korean economy started to falter, eventually leading to famine. And as David pointed out, even though North Korea at that point could buy uh, fuel products on international markets, uh, its inefficient industries couldn't export their goods competitively. There was simply uh, no money with which to buy uh, energy products on international markets and connect them to North Korea's domestic industry. Uh, and in subsequent decades, uh, North Korea has, uh, its economy has rebounded uh, to some extent, even though energy usage has remained uh, quite low. Uh, there was a period of, I think, pretty modest but sustained economic growth uh, in the 2010 to 2016 period, as David points out, uh, because of marketization uh, tolerated by the government, because of deepening trade between North Korea and China. And one, uh, one sector that largely remained out of that um, process of marketization was, was the energy grid. As North Korea uh, maintained the energy grid more or less within the state plan, allocating energy according to political prioritization uh, rather than uh, economic demand. So things like uh, any given city, certainly the statues of the Kim family would get top priority to make sure they're always lit up. Uh, party or military headquarters would get a more uh, stable supply of electricity. Uh, industry less so and residential areas uh, at the bottom. Uh, now, of course, uh, North Korean entrepreneurs, individuals managed to find workarounds to that system. Uh, whether through purchasing solar panels or uh, diesel generators, or in some cases, uh, entrepreneurs uh, paying off the commanders of local military bases to siphon electricity or use uh, military trucks to uh, supply goods across the country for markets. Um, and actually, the North Korean government, it seems, has taken some small steps uh, in, in very recent years to put its uh, electrical grid on something slightly closer to a market basis. Uh, there have been reports, for example, of electricity meters being installed in um, residential areas of Pyongyang. Uh, if Pyongyangites want to use what the North Korean authorities would deem an excessive amount of electricity, they've got to pay for it in hard currency. Uh, that's a more economically efficient way of allocating electricity demand. It um, you know, certainly pays for the North Korean government since people are paying for electrical use rather than getting it for free. Uh, not much help though to the majority of North Koreans who remain at the bottom of the economic period and don't have the cash to actually pay for household electricity use. Uh, looking at the bigger picture on UN sanctions, um, I would um, characterize the, the most recent UN resolutions as essentially uh, doing two big things on uh, fuel exports to North Korea. Uh, one, they allowed Chinese crude oil exports to more or less stay at the same level uh, that they've been suspected to be at for the past 10 years or so, around 525,000 tons a year, uh, while nominally blocking other crude oil exports uh, from coming into North Korea. And the UN sanctions also capped uh, North Korean refined fuel imports uh, at about 10% of what they were uh, pre-sanctions uh, before they were adopted in 2017. Uh, so of course, uh, North Korea has been quite adept at getting around those sanctions. Uh, it's been particularly adept at using uh, ship to ship transfers uh, to basically siphon fuel from one uh, fuel tanker on the high seas uh, to one of its own before bringing it into the country. And as the panel of experts uh, points out, in the last couple of years, uh, North Korea's sanctions evasion in that regard has gotten uh, quite a bit more brazen. Uh, the fuel transfers are taking place not in kind of remote areas far from the Korean Peninsula, uh, but are taking place fairly close by in Chinese territorial waters, often uh, pretty close to major Chinese ports. Uh, we've also seen, according to the panel of experts, more direct fuel deliveries uh, to North Korea 
by fuel tankers that take various steps uh, to hide their identities and ownership. Uh, so where does that leave us in the big picture? I think it's clear that, you know, absent a major North Korean provocation of some sort or another, uh, China and Russia are not going to change their tune when it comes to enforcing North Korean sanctions anytime soon. Uh, and even if sanctions were fully enforced, I, I don't believe that they would have enough uh, coercive power to get North Korea to abandon its nuclear weapons program to unilaterally disarm uh, through sanctions alone. I mean, I just look at North Korea's response to COVID this year. They have essentially sealed off their border to travelers. They've dramatically uh, reduced the level of uh, imports coming into the country. Um, and that's self-imposed. That's not, you know, they've, they've done a lot more self-imposed economic damage than sanctions have done. And certainly even a robust sanctions regime, I think would be very difficult to get North Korea to feel like there's enough economic damage done to give up what it calls its treasured sword uh, defending the Kim regime. But I think there is some uh, grounds for optimism at the same time. Uh, if the US is willing to temper its expectations a bit and look for a uh, freeze in North Korea's nuclear missile program, rather than a rollback in its entirety. Uh, North Korea could very well come out of the COVID situation uh, with a deeply damaged economy, with some severe health, public health problems, and deeply enthralled to China, which uh, Pyongyang has never really trusted Beijing. Uh, so there could be some room for the US and other parties to negotiate, perhaps using energy sanctions as a first card to get North Korea to take some initial steps. And then I think that there could be some room after that to think about creative ways uh, to talk about um, incentivizing North Korea to take further action through uh, upgrading its energy infrastructure if it's willing to take further steps uh, toward uh, freezing or starting to roll back its nuclear program. So thanks again uh, to David for a great presentation and I'll turn it back to Professor Arrington. Thank you very much, Dan. Um, I think this will give us a nice uh, sense of the bigger picture here. Um, I'd like to open it up to questions, but let me um, possibly take the moderator's prerogative and uh, ask an initial question. And um, that is that you, David, you mentioned the sources um, for your information are often very challenging to get at. Uh, for the supply and demand um, in terms of North Korea's energy use and production. And I'm wondering over the years that you've been following North Korea's energy situation, are, what are the biggest changes in terms of the availability of sources? Um, you mentioned, for example, Chinese import statistics on generators or China's decision to stop reporting its exports of oil in 2015. Uh, so what are some of the biggest changes or improvements or, uh, you know, deterioration in your sources for the information that you use to compile these reports? Well, um, there's never been a lot of public information to tell you the truth. So it's been, we've been obliged to, to get whatever information we could and to try and, and uh, mix and match it make it make it fit um, into this, this supply demand balance and what we've tried to do is be very transparent about what our assumptions are and and hope that anybody who has a better idea uh, better uh, better information can come forward and and tell us so that we can modify them uh, certainly the the it used to be the the chinese custom statistics were pretty much reported like clockwork um, and and you could rely on those to to see what was going in and out of China between the DPRK and China. Um, the last few years, especially for oil and oil products, that hasn't been the case, and 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 uh, we've had to rely on um, our assumptions or or panel of experts estimates of of unofficial trades. So so that's been a big change, but. Basically, it's it's always been a challenge to get information about the DPRK, and and uh, our, we've we've 
we ask, you know, we, we interview people who've been there. We, um, we, the few times that we've been there, we sort of look around ourselves and to, to the extent we can with, with minders on, uh, around us all the time. And uh, we use every sort of scrap of news information or whatever, whatever we can lay our hands on, good analysis by colleagues. Thank you. Um, I have a question here from Frank. Um, so he um, asks, what has been the overall history of China in terms of providing oil to North Korea over the last 30 years? And I think specifically here gets at your point about um, export statistics from China. To what extent is it subsidized or traded, exchanged for other goods, bartered um, to achieve a balance of payment? And to what extent has China used the cutoff of that pipeline that you mentioned um, to extract policy concessions from Pyongyang? Well, uh, that's a good question. And, and so for, since about 20, two, 2000, China has, has consistently provided about a half million tons or, or maybe more, perhaps 100 or 200 million, uh, thousand tons over that. To, in terms of, of crude oil to the DPRK through its pipeline. It's also provided varying amounts of uh, oil products, and those are reflected in, in the custom statistics. If you look at the prices that the DPRK has paid or, or has been listed to, be, to have been paid in the custom statistics, they're generally pretty close to international prices. Um, but that doesn't. But that there's there's two things that that doesn't mean, and one is that there's not more crude oil flowing through that pipeline than has been reported, and I'm I'm pretty sure that that's been the case in in especially recent years, and and two that that the 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 payments for that crude oil may may be on a concessional basis. I just have no information as to whether it is or it isn't. Probably is to a degree. But but there, there's no way to know. I, I think that maybe some folks in our in our um, intelligence community could could provide a little more background on what's what's going through that pipeline simply by counting tank cars. But even that is going to be inaccurate because uh, the the oil that's going through the pipeline doesn't get to the terminal in the across the Yellow River in China by pipeline. It gets there by rail tank car from several hundred kilometers away. Does that answer? Thank you. I, you think that I answers think so. the question? Okay. <laughs> um, it's a little one-sided here without yeah. um, hearing from Frank personally. But so we had two other questions from Lucas Quill and Michael J. Kim about um, the ship-to-ship -ship transfers or mar maritime sources of um, energy or fuel. And I think both you and Dan mentioned uh, that ship-to-ship -ship transfers seem to become more, Dan used the word brazen in recent years. So is this another sign of essentially China allowing these to happen in Chinese waters, uh, facilitating, if you want to put it this way, sanctions evasion, or um, how would you interpret that, I, the ship-to-ship -ship transfers? Well, it, it's, it is probably, difficult probably would be difficult for for china to to shut down those ship to ship transfers and and they probably have limited incentive to do so anyway it wouldn't be impossible but they'd have to devote a lot of resources to it um so whether they're facilitating it or simply just looking the other way a little bit uh, i think it's 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 clear that that that's happening that the ship-to-ship -ship transfers are happening, and that they could be doing more about it, but you know, may, maybe don't have the incentive to do so, or have disincentives because they they want to keep the DPRK economy functioning at least at a level that will keep refugees from flowing north across the border into China. I guess Lucas Quo's specific question here was how much of North Korea's fuel supply chain is dependent on such foreign vessels delivering fuel or via ship to ship transfers? Do you have a sense of the proportion of? Um, I, I, I don't remember the numbers, but they are in our papers. So I would, <laughs> I would, I would encourage you to have a look at our, our paper published, I think in July on, on the nautilus.org website. 
Impressionistically, you know, my sense has been that, you know, prior to sanctions, North Korea's fuel imports were, you know, about half from crude oil from pipeline from, from China, about half refined fuel, you know, give or take by a decent amount, maybe a little more on the crude oil side than the refined fuel side. Um, and certainly the, the crude oil volumes have probably stayed the same or as David's indicated, possibly increased uh, since sanctions have uh, been in place. Refined fuel, I think, you know, judging from the panel of experts reports, probably that's dropped to some extent from its peak uh, around 2015, 2016. Uh, certainly the cost of smuggling uh, refined fuel uh, doing these ship to ship transfers is somewhat greater than you know, just buying it commercially. Uh, but judging at least by reported fuel prices in North Korea, it uh, doesn't seem like it's been a huge uh, drop in, in total refined fuel availability. Great, thank you. Um, I have a question from Anne Vroom. Uh, so she's asking, is there any nuclear energy generation activity in North Korea? There, so there are two reactors in, in the DPRK, apart from a small um, test reactor that was imported many, many years ago. There, there are two reactors in the DPRK. One is, is uh, what's been called a, a five megawatt electric reactor, but as far as we can tell, has not actually ever produced electricity. What it has been used is, is to produce plutonium for nuclear weapons. There is a second reactor that, that the DPRK has had under construction, which it calls its, its experimental light water reactor. And it's quite small. It's about uh, 20 or 25 megawatts. Um, as opposed to a commercial reactor, which might be, which is, is a thousand megawatts like, that you would see in, in, in South Korea or, or the United States. Uh, we don't think that it is operated yet, and other analysts who've been watching it don't, don't feel that it's operated yet. It looks complete. It's right next to, it's in the Yongbyon uh, nuclear complex, and it's right next to the other uh, plutonium producing reactor. So, I think the answer is there's probably effectively no nuclear electricity produced right now in the DPRK. Thanks. Um, another source of energy is sort of the renewable or natural sources. You mentioned coal, which uh, North Korea has quite a bit of, and then the long history, both you and Dan mentioned, of hydroelectric um, dams. Are there other um, potentials for renewable sources of energy or more sustainable? Uh, sources? Well, there, there is uh, the potential to have wind and solar energy. Uh, the problem with wind and so wind, wind energy is there aren't that many places in the DPRK that have a really good wind regime. There's, there's sort of a place up in the northeast, the, around the islands of the northeast where, where the DPRK meets Russia and China. Um, that, that have pretty good wind potential. And then along the spine of the country, the, the, the mountainous areas, um, there may be reasonable wind potential there. But uh, our, our group, Nautilus Institute, actually put up uh, a bunch of little windmills, really tiny windmills, in, in a flood affected area of, of the DPRK in 1998 and 2000. And the wind regime there was really not very good. So uh, I, I'd say wind is, is a good pot potential for offshore and, and in, in some areas. Um, but it, it's, not, it's not really a panacea nationwide. Solar is not so bad. I mean, it's about the same as would be in Washington, D.C. Or, or, or in Seoul in terms of uh, the solar resource. It's not great, but it's, it, it's not Sahara, but it's not so bad. And, and uh, that's, so, so uh, solar panels, that's, that's what a lot of people have been turning to, individuals have been turning to is, is small solar panels imported from, from China so that they can run their, um, run their, their uh, media players and, and, their, and nighttime lighting and, um, and, and other, other small uses. And, and I think that's, that's been quite important in terms of what the individual's um, individual services because if you compare that with what, what they would be paying in, in batteries to run those devices, it's, 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 it's quite an opportunity cost there. 
I would add as well that um, the UN sanctions, you know, not only are there restrictions on exports of fuel to North Korea, uh, but they also cover exports of uh, metals, machinery, electrical equipment and vehicles, a category uh, very broadly defined, uh, which includes things like solar panels, uh, generators, a lot of the industrial equipment that you'd need to you know, build or renovate uh, dams or turbines or other electricity uh, generation. Uh, it's not really clear how much of those types of items are still getting through to North Korea. Uh, certainly there's a lot of smuggling going on along the border, um, but whether or not there's been a significant uh, drop in availability, uh, either for kind of household items like generators or uh, solar panels or for the bigger industrial equipment is still more of an open question at this point. And I think that gets to you know, some long-term uh, electricity generation issues in North Korea as well. Thanks. Um, I forgot to mention that was a question from James Pick. Um, let me turn now to a related question from Kim Song-hee who asks if North Korea has found a way to survive the sanctions or especially individuals figured out a way to hook up their own photovoltaic uh, sources of energy, do we still need the sanctions? It's a good question. <laughs> and and uh, I think that given the history, you, you can't simply remove them and say, okay, we're going to start all over. Um, I don't think that would work in the United States and, and with, with, with the politics of the United States and maybe even not in, in South Korea. Um, but I think some way forward has to be found where you're, where you're offering some sanctions relief in, in terms of in, 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 re in exchange for small steps on the DPRK side, maybe letting uh, the inspectors, I, the International Atomic Energy ins uh, agency inspectors back in to 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 monitor the nuclear facilities or some other some other small step uh in exchange for some some modest sanctions relief and maybe some energy aid uh, in, in as dan mentioned in in a provided in a in a creative manner and and uh to to try and get the country to open up a little bit and and uh to es establish some communication and cooperation Thank you. In, I think this um, question from Che Konu follows on that and it's um, getting at what the long term effects of sanctions by the UN and then bilateral and other sanctions might have on the North Korean situation. Do you think that on balance they are affecting North Korea's nuclear weapons capabilities or its program, or is the effect more on the ordinary lives of North Koreans, and perhaps especially through the energy lens here? I, I think that the uh, probably the, uh, the sanctions have, have sort of retarded an economic um, reorganization that might have happened otherwise, but I think that once sanctions are lifted, that that reorganization probably will, will start again. Uh, I think that the sanctions have probably had not very much impact on on the weapons um, programs at all, because the last th that's that's the that's the last place where where cuts are going to come in the DPRK. There, that's 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 it's important to them in terms of their national prestige, and that's where the money is going to go if there's any money at all. Um, so it has affected the lives probably of, of individual citizens and, and of individual businesses. Um, but uh, they, they probably have, it, they haven't had all that much impact, I don't think, on, on the weapons program. But on the other hand, the international community hasn't had that many levers to pull in order to, to uh, compel various uh, behaviors on on behalf of North Koreans. Yeah, I, I agree with everything David said. I just add, I think one of the biggest impacts of sanctions as well has been, you know, totally reorienting uh, North Korea's global economic engagement toward China and giving China really um, major role both in, uh, you know, 
opening or closing the pressure, economic pressure on North Korea, on basically being the transit point for North Korea's economic engagement uh, with the world. I think that is, to some extent, as I mentioned, uh, a point of leverage in negotiations with North Korea because they don't want China to have such a predominant role in how they engage with the rest of the world. Yeah, I think that brings us sort of full circle back to Frank Arm's question that we started with about the role of China. Um, I think uh, I, since we're at the time now, I'm going to close it out. But David, did you want to offer any final words? Um, no, I, I think that the role of China is, is very important. We shouldn't forget that, that Russia does have a, a presence there as well and, and, uh, and continues to have that presence. Um, yeah, I, I really think that the, we have to start thinking more creatively about means of engagement, provide, provide a few more carrots in addition to the sticks that are the sanctions and, and, and think about ways to, to develop engagement strategies that will be politically useful, not just to our leaders, but, but to their leader, because they have, uh, Kim, Kim Jong-un has a domestic audience, domestic political audience that he has to satisfy as well. So I uh, shouldn't forget that. And, and I think what we found in, in working with North Koreans is, is that they're, 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 very, uh, they're very well trained in terms of their basic science and engineering. And, and uh, they, they catch on very rapidly. And um, they're, uh, they're, they're people, <laughs> they're still people just, just, just as we are. And we ought to be looking for ways to, to bring more of the international community in contact with more, more North Koreans in terms of the, the cooperation engagement options that we consider. Thank you very much. I think that's a nice way to wrap up the discussion for today. Um, I apologize to the questions that we didn't get a chance to get to. Um, if you have, take a look at the Q&A, there are a few more there from, um, say, Tom Russo and Hazel Smith and others. So let me just um, thank, again, David von Hippel and Dan Wirtz for uh, thought-provoking and interesting discussion today. Um, and stay tuned for many more uh, discussions from our GW Institute for Korean Studies on these topics. Um, so thank you again to both of you for your time today and for all of the participants. Mm -hmm.